founder of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform uh, at the intersection of finance, technology, and geopolitics. Assault Talks are a series of digital interviews where we try to bring on what we think are top thinkers, investors, and innovators across uh, finance, technology, and politics. And today we're very excited uh, about the guests that we have. Uh, General John Kelly is joining us today. Uh, General Kelly is a retired U.S. Marine Corps general, as, as most of you know, who from 2012 to 2016 served as a four-star general uh, leading the U.S. Southern Command. Uh, he also served as President Trump's White House uh, Chief of Staff. Uh, previous to that, he served as the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. So we're extremely excited to have General Kelly on here today. We actually scheduled this talk weeks in advance. This is not a, a talk that was scheduled specifically to address uh, the recent issues that have faced the country and the recent comments uh, of, of General Mattis and General Kelly as it relates to the current situation going on in the country. But, you know, we're very excited to have him here and he's very graciously agreed to join us. Um, General Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you and Anthony uh, for the interview. Thanks, John. Uh, John, thanks so much. And uh, uh, General John Kelly, it's a, always a pleasure to be with you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity this morning. And I, I want to reemphasize that uh, this wasn't this was not set up uh, uh, recently. Uh, uh, General Kelly and I decided to do this about three or four weeks ago. I actually thought the more specific things would be talking about the virus and what we can do as a nation to uh, get our economy regoing. And certainly I want to talk about that. Uh, but General, you know, there's, a, there's an elephant in the room. So I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about that first, if you don't mind. Some of the military leaders recently have you know, caution the president as it relates to the Constitution. And obviously, General Mattis, somebody you're close to, has issued a statement or an essay uh, related to this stuff. And I was just wondering if you could remark on that, because I think that once we get the elephant out of the room, we can talk about some of the other great things that we have on our agenda. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I would just offer to you that uh, the U.S. military, uh, of course, since 1972, is an all-volunteer force. Uh, but even way back when we have uh, always attempted to be apolitical. I would tell you, Anthony, that uh, the number of military members that vote in every single election is very, very high percentage. So we're, uh, we obviously have our political beliefs, some are Democrats, some Republicans, some liberals, some conservative, uh, but you almost never, ever hear a political discussion, you know, even after work over a couple of beers between friends, you just, it's, it's very, very apolitical. And we, we, we think that's important because the US military uh, serves the nation, all of its people, not a party, not a political persuasion, not an individual. Uh, we swear, every one of us swear multiple times when you get promoted typically as an example, every time when you come in initially, you swear to support and defend the constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign domestic. Um, the difference with us in the military, though, uh, because that's the same oath that senators take and congressmen take and presidents take and, and other officials that enter the U.S. government. The difference was with, with us, and I made this point to many people at the White House when I first got here, got there, is these young people, part of that commitment is also to give you a life for this country. And no one's ever going to ask any public official, member of Congress, to give their life and support and defend the Constitution. But that's how serious it is to us. And so, and we're devoted to protecting this country in the away game that is overseas. In extremist situations, we've been used, active duty have been used in the United States, but really in extremist situations. Uh, our police are overwhelmingly great men and women, but we have to fix those that aren't and the procedures that should not be in place. Our National Guard folks are today very well trained. They're closer to the to the neighborhoods, to the states, and if the senate or if the governors want to, they own them. They can they can activate them, and they can do a very very good job. But the idea that you would unleash uh, American active duty folks, uh, unless it's an extremist situation, um, and again, they don't come in shooting. I've, I've done that kind of duty myself as a young enlisted marine in 1971, then as a major, uh, in some uh, some some issues that are they're fairly well known uh, on the streets of the United States. The troops hate it. They don't see it as their job. Uh, they don't want to be used in that way unless it's really extremist. Now, 
natural disasters, different story. Hurricanes, earthquakes, we, we lean forward in the US military to help. But uh, these are domestic issues and we should really, in my view, most people's view that have served in, in the United States, uh, these are civilian uh, responsibilities and we should be very, very careful before we uh, contemplate sending in uh, active so, duty so, military. So, sir, you know, G General Mattis, uh, we both know him. He's a very well-read guy. He's a student of the Constitution, constitutional history, right back to the convention. So, you know, he wrote a pretty strong statement. Do you, do you agree he with sure the did. statement? Do you, do you think what he's saying, uh, we've crossed over the line, so it was necessary for him to make a statement like that? Uh, I did. I did not talk to to, to uh, General Mattis before he said that we're we're friends. We we correspond fairly frequently. Uh, he does not take that. None of us would take making a statement like that lightly. Um, but there is a concern. Uh, I think an awful big concern that uh, the uh, the partisanship of, has gotten out of hand. The tribal thing has gotten out of hand. Uh, we don't look at each other as fellow Americans, it seems, anymore. We look at each other as opponents. We don't talk to each other. We yell at each other. Um, he's quite a man, General Jim Mattis, and for him to do that tells you where he is relative to the concern he has for our country. Do you, do you agree with him, John? I agree with him. I, mm -hmm. I think we need to step back from the politics. I think we need to reestablish you know, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but boy, do I read a lot. And I've reread an awful lot in the last three weeks uh, about the thinking that made our constitution what it is, the men who made that constitution, um, who, who developed that constitution. And the separation of powers is, is, is very, very, very important. Uh, no president ever is, uh, is a dictator or, or a king, just like the uh, courts have to work with the other two branches that the Congress has got oversight that they must, must, must uh, execute, um, not just in a partisan way. As an example, I would tell you that, that uh, and I think I read something to where the Congress is going to start taking a look at, you know, police departments, how they, what their tactics are, best practices, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's very, very healthy. I hope it doesn't turn into the usual finger pointing. Uh, I think they're about to do the same thing, I hope in terms of looking at the coronavirus and uh, kind of a 9-11 look, 9-11 commission, what could we have done better? No finger pointing, no condemnation. In, in today's environment, probably impossible to hope for that. Um, but I, I do think this, we're a little bit out of balance relative to how the, the country's functioning and how American citizens are looking at their government. I think we really need to you know, step back. Uh, I, think, I think we need to look harder at who we elect. I think we should start, all of us, regardless of what our, our views are on politics, I think we should look at people that are running for office and put them through the filter. Are they, are they, what is their character like? Uh, what, is their, what are their ethics? Uh, are they willing, if they're elected, to represent all of their constituents, not just the base, uh, but all of their constituents? Um, and then look at the politics and say, okay, I like this guy or this gal because uh, he, 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 or he, he or she thinks the same way I do in politics. But, but I, I really do believe, I, I, I think we, we really need to start looking at uh, more and more veterans running for office. When you, when you serve in uniform, even for four years, or you're in the National Guard, or you're in the, the reserves, you look at America differently. You may look at the American experience and experiment very differently. Um, and I think, you know, there's a website um, I'd like to bring your attention. It's With Honor. It's a website, a bunch of uh, young guys from Afghanistan and Iraq who have, who have gotten together and, um, and are raising money to uh, fund members, uh, veterans to run for office. Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. Uh, I think that's part of the solution. The rest of the, another part of the solution is just men and women who have actually done something as opposed to career politicians, you know, governors, uh, you know, businessmen who have actually, you know, done something. But I think the, the veteran thing, I think we have about 20, I think something on the order of 21%, something like that, veterans. Uh, Post-World War II, through Vietnam, we were, we were nearly 80, at times we were above 80%. 
and the difference is back then and fairly recently, they could talk to each other. Uh, that's the one thing I see on, on when I look at the Hill as an American citizen is they're not talking to each other and they're certainly not listening to each other. They're yelling at each other, going to their, going to their partisan corners and the nation suffers, the people no, suffer. I, I, and I appreciate that. I just want to say it's with honor.com just so everybody that's listening in can know that. Um, sir, again, not to, not to put you on the spot, but I think I, I want to get the elephant out of the room because I want to talk about some of these great things here. Uh, and you did do a uh, interview with Josh Dawsey at the Washington Post. Did the president fire Jim Mattis? No, he did not. Um, I don't want to, uh, let me just say that um, over time, um, every relationship up there begins to deteriorate for a lot of different reasons. I don't have to tell you that. Um, well, and you, you, you help, you help, you help me in yeah. a way that I can't fully describe, General. So <laughs> again, I want to thank you for saving my career or my marriage. But uh, but, no, I, but, but they do deteriorate, and you and you and I know why they deteriorate. Right. And so, but but go ahead, sir. Well, you know, in in the in the military, we we do two things right from the right from the cradle to our members coming in. One. Uh, make sure they understand what that oath means and who they're taking that oath to. Uh, and to never follow an order, even if it's accidental, never follow an order that's illegal, that is not consistent with what they understand the laws of war. Well, do you think, do you think President Trump knows the difference, though? I mean, I think that's one of the issues some of the senior people tell me. Uh, unlike you and me, they're, not, they're afraid to put their names on it, but they're worried about him either understanding the Constitution or not understanding the Constitution, just not reading it and not caring, and sort of feeling that uh, he doesn't recognize that your loyalty, sir, is to that document and the institution of our government and that diffusion of power. Um, and so what do you say to that, sir? What's your assessment there? Well, um, if, if when he came in, uh, and I didn't know him very well, I didn't know him at all before I went to Homeland Security, if when he came in, he didn't get it, he certainly got it uh, when he began to interact with guys, well, I think everybody, you know, Rex Tillerson and, and, and Jim Mattis and people like that and, and others in the White House. Um, I think every president is frustrated when they, when they take over uh, at how slow the US government is. Uh, and that's designed to be that way. Um, and, but to your point, I mean, even if he doesn't accept it, the separation of powers and the checks and balances are there. That's why our court system is so incredibly, even though it's somewhat politicized now, our court system is so important to, to slow things down if need be that the United States Congress in their oversight role uh, to call witnesses, any witness they want really to talk about any topic they want to talk about. I mean, a privilege being what it is. Uh, and I think the courts are going to have to work out the absolute privilege that uh, the current president feels as though he can exert. But this separation of powers, I mean, if you go back and, 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 and read what, uh, what guys like Adams in Washington and Jefferson were talking about, uh, it was incredibly frustrating for, the, for those early presidents, as it is, I think, for the current president. I know for the current president to not get things done. Why do I have to go to Congress? Well, that's, and it's designed that way. The oversight's critical. Uh, Obviously, the courts are critical in the administration trying to get a job done. Um, but again, one of the other things we teach our men and women is truth to power. Uh, your loyalty is to the Constitution, to the country, to the people. And you are, you must tell your boss the truth. And if he, rege if he rejects it, fine. Uh, if it's so bad in your opinion that you can't morally, ethically deal with it, then you can resign. Uh, some do, but uh, you have got to tell truth to power. The problem with that is, depending on the individual, they could interpret that as disloyalty. Uh, and uh, and I think again, if you look at the the history of people that have served in this in this administration, it's, it's quite a large turnover. Yeah. Well, it, but so let's put everything into context. We're both talking about the great institutions of our democracy. We're talking about the constitutional document, and so. General Mattis writes that there is a concern that the document's being threatened by the way we're using our military, and you agree with that, sir? Is that 
fair to say? I, 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 would, I would agree that the, the document is always being stressed uh, when public officials, and that might be the military, could be police, could be a president. When public officials are um, coming close to the edge of the rule of law, uh, again, there's a tension in our government. It's built in. It was, I mean, the great wisdom of the founders. And again, I'm not a, I, I'm just a, you know, regular old American citizen that reads a lot. But the uh, the tension that's built in, uh, the the uh, complexity of the government to slow things down. I mean, we can act very quickly as a government if we need to. Pearl Harbor is an example. Uh, yep. uh, you know, 9/11, post 9/11 is an example. Um, you saw us, I think, in the, in the coronavirus, once there was an acceptance that this thing was real and was going to whack us really hard. I think the government, uh, you know, the experts and the, you know, the, uh, the health, health experts stepped forward. Um, one, one, one last question on this, and let's move to something else that I know we both want to talk about. Uh, if you were the White House chief of staff and you were sitting in the Oval Office and there was an idea that they were going to use the American military or the National Guard to clear out peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square, possibly use a smoke canister or tear gas so that the president could walk to St. John's Cathedral and take a picture, uh, wh what would your advice have been? Well, um, let, me, let me start by uh, saying that the job of a chief of staff is to uh, run the staff, which I did, and to come up with the best options for the principal, in this case, uh, Mr. Trump, but well, I was essentially the chief of staff, military chief of staff or Secretary Gates and Secretary Panetta, same thing. Um, so my opinion was less um, important. I mean, I would always give my opinion generally behind closed doors. Uh, but my job was, okay, Mr. President, okay, Mr. Secretary, or when I was a chief of staff as a military guy working for generals, I'd say, okay, uh, let me start the staff process on this. First step would be uh, on any decision or desire would be, do you have the legal authority to do it? That was easy. You get the lawyers to come in and say, you know, yes, he has the legal authority under some law to do it. Or no, he doesn't. We've got to go to the Congress. Okay. That then tells you what, which, which direction you're going to go in. Um, on any idea, you had to bring in the issue of is, is this, I mean, always, is this good for America? Uh, one of the things I think an awful lot of people in Washington forget is that at the end of the day, they're there to serve America, not re-election, not the Democratic but, but, but Party. But was that good for America to do that? I would argue that the end result of that um, was predictable. Um, you know, and I, again, it, it's still, the, the jury's still out on tear gas and who got hit. And I mean, again, but um, um, I, I would have argued against it, recommended against it, not argued, just recommended against it. And, and you, you, but the president of the United States, I don't care if you like Donald Trump or you hate him. He's the president of the United States. He deserves the best advice he can get from his staff, from his cabinet, from experts, so that he can make the best decision for our country. Uh, I yeah. think a lot of times the decision is wh who's going to win in November. And I think in terms of what's going on in the country today or the coronavirus, it's not about that. It's about America. I know it's Pollyannish. Yeah. No, I know no, it's sir, naive, I appreciate maybe, it. I think but this is why you, you and I like each other so I, I appreciate it. Do you think General Mattis is overrated, sir? Jim Mattis overrated? Yeah. No. Not overrated, right? He's not overrated. What if I asked you this as a Saul conference? Forgive me, I got to ask it again. Is, is the president a stable genius, or is he a very stable genius? Um, he's, what's a genius? I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, he is, uh, as I say, when I was there, uh, working the staff pro uh, process. More often than not, he didn't like the recommendations. Uh, more often than not, he followed the recommendations of the, of the staff, of the cabinet. Um, but I, I don't think I should uh, comment on, um, you know, not, a, not, not qualified to comment on stable or unstable or whatever. All right, well, 
Well, you, you mentioned to me before we got this started that uh, there's a need for more post-partisanship. Uh, you, uh, you were talking about a potential uh, commission, like the 9-11 commission. Tell us a little bit about your ideas about how to handle what's going on here. We've got two major problems, right? We have this systemic racial divide, and then we have the COVID-19 situation as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, anytime you, whether it's in the military or anywhere, police departments, whatever, anytime there's a, a success or a failure, I mean, you, you're hoping for successes, right? Anytime there's a success or a failure, uh, you should sit down, in the military we call it, uh, you know, after action reports, where you sit down and you're brutally honest about why it happened. You say it, whether it went wrong and, you know, say it was a negative thing, why it happened, what we could have done better uh, to improve upon that. You know, the, the 9-11 report, and again, just like the Mueller report, the vast majority of Americans have never read it, it's good reading because an awful lot of very smart people sat down and said, okay, 9-11, how did we miss that? You know, what, where was our, you know, the men and women of the FBI, the finest law enforcement uh, people in the world, uh, their reputation has been sullied, uh, unfortunately, but they are the rank and file, the best in the world. Our law enforcement fall into the same category, our intel uh, establishment that really looks overseas. Uh, and there's always a nice handoff between, between them. The point is, they sat down and they said, how could 9-11 have happened? And they came up with a bunch of recommendations, and those recommendations have uh, proven to be very effective. I, I can't go into it, uh, but I would tell you that uh, the attempts by uh, extremists overseas are constant, taking down airplanes, trying to get their hands on weapons of mass destruction, a lot of things and everything in between. And it's because of the end result of the 9-11 Commission and things that have been put in place and the cooperation between police departments and intelligence community and, uh, and the FBI uh, and others, DHS, incredible uh, capability in the DHS. They fight the, the home game as opposed to the DOD away game. And all of these uh, attempts to come and hurt us in America, uh, and frankly, to hurt our uh, overseas uh, uh, station people in, in uh, embassies, we've been able to, we've been just about 100% effective. Uh, so a commission like that to look at, say, the coronavirus and say, how, how did it happen? Was, was our response too slow, too fast, not, you know, whatever. Uh, and so when the next one comes, uh, and there will be a next one, that we can just kind of pull the, uh, you know, pull the, take the plan out of the can and execute it. Well, one of the, one of the things that came out of that commission was a uh, department that you ended up leading, the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Do you think that another cabinet level department is in the offing uh, as a result of this pandemic? Or do you think it can get be, be done by the interagency efforts? Or do you think it has to be a singular focus of somebody? Yeah, Anthony, I think, Within HHS and other parts of our government, there are incredibly talented people who do nothing but look at this. Um, but I think probably you know to look maybe harder at how the interagency, you know, the the the, uh, uh, the scientists and the doctors that are expert at this, all they can do is tell the decision makers, look, this is a problem. It's coming. Hold on to your hat. Uh, we need to fill in the blanks, wear masks, whatever. whatever. Um, and then the very, very hard job of the president and, and the interagency people are, how do we balance uh, this problem that's coming with, um, with the economy? Uh, how do we balance what's coming with so many other things? And, and as I say, there's, uh, there's ways to do that, I think, in a nonpartisan way, uh, you know, Senate and House hearings certainly are important, but they tend to be too, uh, too parochial, too tribal. Uh, and, and again, this is, this is America we're talking about. I, I would give you the example when I was uh, at uh, Southern Command in uniform, my responsibility was all of the Caribbean and Latin America. And I had tremendous relationships down there with the leaders and the, the military leaders and, and, the, and the Mexican leaders and political leaders. Um, and when I saw Ebola, um, 
coming out of Africa, which of course would have been a catastrophe. Uh, and knowing the countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, many of which are very, very advanced, great people, uh, some are at risk countries though and have uh, very poor or, or marginal uh, healthcare systems. So I'm thinking to myself, and I said to my staff, what if it comes to the Western Hemisphere? What countries in our hemisphere do we immediately have to help like 100%? What countries in our hemisphere, if it comes, can handle an Ebola outbreak? I called uh, Jay Johnson, who was the Department of Homeland Security at the time. Uh, Jay had already started the process of looking hard at how people had come here from the infected area, it happened to be Africa at the time, uh, as if they were traveling to the United States, how did they get here? And, and, and working with uh, uh, people overseas without being told to do so uh, in Europe and places like that to, to add uh, additional, uh, um, additional monitoring. I went down to the, the, uh, the center, you know, active duty military guy down to the uh, Center for D Disease Control to find out what their capabilities are. I really wanted to know, look, if this thing hits one of these uh, at-risk countries, how fast can we go and help them? Um, and, that, you know, they hadn't thought of that. Uh, and it's not a criticism. But the point is, uh, that's how, in, that's, in, there was a lot of leaning forward on the Ebola. I, I was out of government on the uh, coronavirus. Uh, it seemed to me there was a lot of leaning forward by the uh, people in HHS and in DHS. Uh, but again, the, the real tough one every time is, how does how do the whether it's the governor or the or the or the president or whoever local officials, how do they how do they uh, balance it? Based on your observation and how things unfolded, uh, uh, what would be an immediate piece of advice that you'd have for the government in general? And again, not not a partisan thing, just an immediate piece of advice on the virus. Yeah, on the virus. Yeah, I would I would if, and I'm not saying they are. If some of the international organizations are not effective, I don't know if they are or not. Uh, I would know if I was still the chief of staff. But if, if, as you hear sometimes, they're not effective, then kick them in the ass and get them going. If we have uh, organizations in our own government, in our own infrastructure, that, um, that are uh, not up to the task, then kick them in the butt and let's, let's get going. I would say strong, particularly in the world of, of viruses and whatnot and pandemics, I would say the, the more we can do for information exchange and that, you know, scientists that will live in China, scientists that will live in Africa, Americans, uh, you know, a free flow of information. Um, you know, the Chinese don't, didn't seem to cover themselves with glory on this one in terms of sharing information. They, if you read the reporting, they still aren't. But we got to do you, better at that. When you say push the organizations, would you withdraw from any though? Do you think it's a good idea to withdraw from the World Health Organization? No. Again, if it, it fundamentally, it's 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 mission is a good mission, or is a mission that's someone should do that mission. Uh, if they're not doing it, then change, decide why they're not doing it, and how to make it better. But I'm of the opinion that uh, the more the U.S. is involved. Uh, as a leader, the better the world is, not just for the for Americans in, in America, but the better the world is uh, overseas. But someone's got to lead. And, and we used to do it a lot. We're, I think, doing it less so now. So uh, when you talk about leadership, sometimes we have to make tough decisions, obviously, and we have to like uh, balance things. Uh, and before we started, you and I were talking about the American military, and there have been issues historically with the American military with political leadership. We know the very famous issue between General MacArthur and, and President Truman, and there were issues in the Vietnam War, and perhaps there were some related to Iraq and Afghanistan. And I guess the question I have for you, what, what, what is your advice to military leaders and political leaders in terms of working those things out? How, how do you create that synthesis that we're all looking for? Well, again, I mean, you, the going in is uh, never never even come close to uh, doing something that's illegal and uh, tell your boss the truth. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a, if a young NCO talking to the battalion commander or, or a, uh, or a colonel talking to a four star. What if the, uh, what if the, what if your boss doesn't like the truth, sir, then what do you do? 
Well, one of two things. He'll either fire you and find a, a lackey that will tell him, he'll try to find a lackey that will tell him what he wants to hear, uh, or he'll push so hard that you'll decide to leave. But we should never, ever, I mean, if you are a boss, whether you're a four-star general, battalion commander, uh, a governor, or a member of Congress, uh, the minute you, you have a sense that your staff is telling you what you want to hear as opposed to what you must hear, get a new staff or get a new staff member. Uh, these decisions, particularly our president, whoever the president is, they're so monumental, so big. Again, whether you like Mr. Trump or not, he's the president of the United States. He is making decisions that affect every one of us. And if you have the right kind of people around you, then at least that president, that decision is well informed. Once he makes the decision, then the job of the chief of staff and the staff is to execute the decision. Uh, but he deserves the best advice from the, from the uh, government that he can get so that he can then make the right decisions. I, I appreciate that, sir. I think that's the big mantra for us at Skybridge and other places. Just tell the truth, even when things are not going well. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to John Darcy, who you know. He's got a few questions from our uh, our audience who's fully engaged here. So go ahead, John. What are your questions for General Kelly? Thanks, General Kelly, again, for joining us. So John, yeah. a common question that we're getting is around, if Trump loses the election, uh, do you expect him to go quietly and peacefully out of office, or do you have any concern about you know, potential disruptions in that scenario? Well, I mean, if he loses, he loses. Um, um... I would say that if it's an overwhelming loss, um, but if it's if it's a close one, uh, we may want we may see an awful lot of recounts and, and all of that kind of thing. But uh, no, I don't. Couldn't imagine that he would do anything other than uh, you know, much like our election in two thousand, let the process work. Courts were involved in Florida, as you recall, or maybe you don't. But, but, I, um, but I think a different question is, sir, is the institutions of our government stronger than the individual? I think that's really the issue. We, yes, of course they are. We have, the, we have these guys that wrote this constitution, I'm telling you, uh, they, they did it well. Um, uh, it's, and it's just not in our tradition as Americans that uh, we, don't, we don't typically as a group like strong, strong, strong men. Uh, we like strong leadership when the, when the time is uh, right. But uh, now we have a very, very strong government with good people, overwhelmingly good people who go to work every day and do the function, whatever it is their function is in our government, is a good people. And again, some of them are Democrats, some of them are Republicans, some of them are atheists, some of them are Muslims. But they're Americans, and, and I, again, I might sound Pollyannish, but uh, that's the world that I came from, and I, I think it's—I have great confidence in our country. Moving on to the next question, you talked a lot about the political polarization that's taking place in the country. How does that affect our ability to confront the geopolitical issues that are facing us as a country? Uh, you know, touch a little bit on things that are going on with U.S.-China relations, yeah. U.S.-Russia relations, and things that are happening in the Middle East. Well, I think if you, first of all, it affects it absolutely because you can't come to any decisions. Remember, the, the Congress has got to propose legislation. They've got to pass the legislation, working with the White House, uh, legislation that the president will sign. Uh, you never going to get 100 percent of what you want. You know, you may only get 40 percent of what you want, but that's the way the government works and the move forward. Uh, if you if you're a Chinese official, as an example, or a Russian official or someone like that, or for that matter, you know, our friends uh, in NATO and places like that. If, you, if you're looking at kind of the chaos or the partisanship in the United States, uh, there are if you're not a friend of the United States, uh, there are ways that's an opportunity for you to advance your own causes globally. If you're a friend, traditional friend of the United States, um, it gives you concern because to date, since World War II, certainly we've always been the leader, uh, not the dictator, but the leader of uh, the free world. And, and we did that in a collaborative way with people in Europe and Asia, South America. 
Um, but I think if you are a, a, an observer looking at what's going on, you realize it's all but, uh, you know, we're almost all stop inside the United States. And we have, we have big, big things we have to, we have to solve. So you, prior to serving as White House Chief of Staff, served as the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and dealt with a lot of immigration-related issues. As, as immigration currently stands in the United States, what do we need to change? What do we need to fix? And, and how would you evaluate your time as Secretary, what you learned uh, in that role? Yeah, John, the first thing you got to do is, you know, people use the term immigration as it applies to anyone that comes to the United States. We have legal immigration in the United States and have for many, many years. Up until I think last year, we were 1.1 uh, million people from around the world came here legally. Uh, this is a process uh, and they came here legally and uh, on a road to citizenship. Uh, the other part of the immigration issue is illegal immigration. And um, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, there's seven and a half billion people on this planet and about four or five of them want to come, want to come for a better life. Uh, but we have to control who comes here. Um, you know, when I was at DHS, I was frequently on the Hill and whatnot, and people on one side of the aisle would criticize about what we were doing in terms of, you know, trying to stop illegal immigrants, trying to, trying to uh, enforce the laws. And I would say, look, you make the laws up here. Uh, it's illegal for someone sworn to enforce the law, like, Department of Homeland Security or police or FBI, it's illegal for them uh, to not enforce the law. So if, if you think the laws need to change, then change them. But if, you, uh, if you're telling me that I can pick and choose the laws that I want to follow, I got all sorts of laws I, I, I prefer, and I don't want to pay my taxes. Uh, so if you're telling me I can pick and choose. Uh, but I think, again, the responsibility of laws and lawmaking rests with the Congress, uh, the president, and of course, the courts to make sure they're in line with what the Constitution uh, dictates or, or, or says. So I would say again, we have to have a we have to have a discussion about immigration. And uh, right now, it's impossible because both sides are yelling at each other, accusing each other, and the and the law enforcement people in the middle are uh, are are caught in the middle because they're supposed to be enforcing laws that uh, Congress enacted. You know, one of the things again, not to you know, the, the, the wall issue, uh, I said in my time at DHS, I didn't think we needed a 2,000 mile wall. But if you talk to the professionals on the border, the Customs and Border Protection people, they will tell you, sir, if you can get me 40 miles or, or 60 miles in this location, that would really help me out. Uh, I did not realize it uh, when, until I took DHS, but in, in 2006, there was a, uh, a law passed on a very bipartisan uh, level. Uh, that uh, authorized, and they did construct, the wall isn't all that good, but they did construct 700 miles of wall, of, of wall along the southwest border. So back in those days, 2006, I guess we could talk to each other and come up with a bipartisan uh, attempt to control our borders. Today, you can't even bring up border wall in, in, before the yelling starts. And somehow we have to sort this out. We talked a little bit earlier about geopolitical related issues. What is the greatest, in your view, geopolitical threat and risk to the United States right now? Well, I mean, I would say that there are countries out there that are, are our competitors, uh, China, Russia. Uh, I don't put them in the enemy category, um, but they're competitors. Uh, the Chinese in particular are very, very smart in how they do business. Um, uh, a lot of patience, a lot of thought. They're very talented people. On, on the other hand, uh, the Russians are a, a little less um, uh, deliberative. Uh, but again, I don't think they're enemies. Uh, they could be someday. I hope not. I pray not. Um, we have more localized enemies for sure. I mean, I think uh, I think Iran unfortunately falls into the category of an enemy. I, you know, the Iranian people. Uh, and people, I don't think, have a, a real appreciation of this. The average Iranian is, uh, is, is, you know, pretty badly held down. Um, it is a police state. Uh, again, there's, we, have to, we have to be very careful out in that part of the world because uh, one miscalculation, one 
young commander on an Iranian fast boat with cruise missiles and I ship missiles could start a major conflagration in that part of the world. Um, that's why it's so important, I believe, that the United States say, stays involved in the world uh, and has an awful lot of friends that we can interact with, talk to, help. Maybe they have better relationships with people that we can ask them to influence those people against uh, irrational acts. Um, it's, it's still a dangerous world and we can still be very badly hurt. Um, and that's why I think, as I say, American leadership is critical. Uh, General, oh, before yeah, General, go ahead, just Anthony. interrupt for one second before we let you go, because this is uh, people are texting me, sir, while you're talking. So I got to ask you, I think it's an interesting question about COVID-19. Do you think the Chinese are taking advantage of the COVID-19 situation in terms of its impact on the West and how they are executing their Belt and Road Initiative? Well, I don't know. Again, I've been out of government for a while. They, uh, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is something they started some time ago. Uh, you know, it's interesting when I was in Latin America, and again, it's our good people, it's our neighborhood. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. There, an awful lot of Latins are, are wondering why the United States doesn't really look south because there are, is so much opportunity there from Central America, Mexico, all the way down to Argentina. We, but the point is, the, the Chinese were smart. They come in and they offer um, help. And most of these countries would, that, that certainly that I experienced in, in Latin America, but I think it applies around the world, would love to have a, a relationship with the United States, a strong relationship with the United States. But since we're not all that interested, um, they will take help from uh, whatever source they can. It comes, as you know, the uh, the help from China comes with a comes with a uh, some commitments. But I remember a uh, more than once members of uh, presidents down there telling me the thing I liked working with the United States was as they were trying to in their own countries uh, eliminate uh, corruption. Uh, and that's something the United States has been asking them, pushing them to do since, you know, the 70s. But anyways, uh, I remember a couple of them telling me separately, two different countries, that the great thing about dealing with the United States is, from a business point of view, is you have laws that restrict your, your companies uh, from offering money, bribes, corruption. And uh, that's why we like working with the United States. Plus, we just like the United States better. But the downside of having the Chinese and others come in is the corruption comes with it. It's how they, they operate. Sir, sir, would you go back into government if given the opportunity? Would you go back? I'm not saying this government, sir. I'm saying a government, a U.S. government. You no, know, maybe I'll end with this. I, I just, uh, I didn't, um, when I retired from the Marine Corps before the 2016 election, I didn't know Donald Trump at all. I didn't know anyone that knew him. I watched the election from a from obviously the a distance. Uh, when I got a call in late December after the election, uh, what I consider coming up and and um, and uh, becoming part of the administration, my my personal feeling was this particular man, based on his background and, and uh, you know that he really would need help. So I I, I told uh, the caller. Um, that I would uh, consider going up and, and interviewing. When I hung up, my wife, who was sitting next to me, we were watching college football on the Saturday afternoon, said, who is that? I explained to her. Uh, and remember, I had just retired from over 40 years in the Marine Corps, you know, 29 moves in our, in our married life around the world, around the country. You don't make any money. Uh, and, uh, but she said to me, look, uh, if, if we're as a family, uh, if we're nothing else, we're a family of service. So uh, you ought to go up there and talk to them and give it a shot. Um, so I did, I got the job at DHS. I was at for six months. I was at uh, the White House for 18 months. And all I can say is uh, I did the best I could uh, within the law and within my oath uh, to keep the train not only running on time, but to keep it on track. Did the best I could. Would you go back though, sir? Let's say there's a new administration, would you? Someone called you and said, hey, we uh, have a job for you. Um, I, 
I would, I would serve. You would. Okay. Yeah, tell my I, wife I said no. that. Oh, well, she, she's listening. Karen. I'm going to, I'm going I'm to call this. She'll, she'll be my first call when this is over. Uh, all right. Well, sir, I, we, we promised a 45 minute hard out. Uh, uh, John and I want to thank you, John, any last lingering questions there you want to fire in? No more questions. You know, I, I think uh, we had several comments in the chat as well about the organization that you mentioned earlier that helps support veteran candidates in the United States. That organization is called With Honor. The domain is withhonor.org. I would strongly recommend that you guys donate to that cause. Uh, you know, the shared sacrifice that our veterans around the country have enables them to come together in a bipartisan way and work together to solve some of these you know, intractable issues that we face and, as a and country. You, and when you go on that website, you'll see that their advisors are phenomenal. Michelle Flournoy, one of the great women in, in our government today or, uh, in, in Washington, uh, Mike Mullen, former uh, chairman of the Joint Staff, uh, Secretary Bob Gates. Um, this is a good effort to try again to, to get veterans, regardless of party, to run for, for public office, whether it's in the United, in, in the Congress, uh, president, or, uh, or out there in the hinterlands. It's a, it's a good effort, I think. I'm not associated in it, with it in any way. I just think it's a good effort. Well, General, you are a great American patriot. You're a dear friend. We thank you for uh, joining us on Assault Talks. Uh, give a shout out to my wife, Deirdre, who thanked you for firing me, sir. Okay, you, Long suffering you know, wife. Yes, you know, she <laughs> loves the fact that you fired me right when you walked into the White House. But I think it's a message to everybody, frankly, that uh, even though you and I got started on an awkward foot in our terms of our relationship, and we got to know each other. And, uh, you know, it's a symbolism about bringing people together. So I really, really admire you, sir. And I greatly appreciate our friendship and our relationship. And I want to Thank you on behalf of everybody that's uh, joined here today. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate it. Okay. God bless you, sir. Yeah, take care. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's SALT Talk. Thank you again to General Kelly for your service to the country uh, and for, for joining us today on this SALT Talk. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with SALT, again, SALT is a global thought leadership platform and networking forum. Uh, we have large conferences around the country. General Kelly, has joined us at conferences previously in Las Vegas and in Abu Dhabi. And we bring people together who are interested in solving uh, big issues around the world related to finance, technology, and, and politics mainly. Uh, you can learn more about SALT at salt.org. And during this uh, work from home period, we're also doing these SALT talks in lieu of our in-person gatherings. And we have a lot of interesting uh, speakers and, and topics across those, uh, those subject matters that I talked about earlier. Uh, so if you want to join some of these future talks, go to salt.org backslash talks. Uh, you can join these talks for free. They're all interactive. You can type questions in the chat the way a lot of you did today. Uh, but thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon on Assault Talk.